it's interesting because I was reading a thing by Jeff Passan about what the Texas Rangers are doing, and they're basically going with a six-man rotation. I, I really don't understand why more teams don't do that because pitchers break. They break often, and uh, they do, you know, the managers and the general managers do every, what, everything they can to try to protect them, limit their innings, don't push them too hard, but they still break and break and break. And um, the, the whole mission of starting pitching has changed dramatically over the years. Um, and it's no longer about, you know, hey, man, you know, I, I need eight from you tonight. Or a guy's rolling up a high pitch count and it's like, ah, oh, let him finish, man. He looks good. And all that stuff. I mean, I, it was just, it's a different time now. And maybe the fact that it's a different time has actually led to the problems because I've heard many of an old school burst baseball person say that, um, you know, one of the reasons pitchers break down is because they're babied so much. And I, I, I got mixed feelings about that. I do think, though, when they are training to reach a specific limit or goal, it's like, well, you don't want to, you know, we probably, we probably got to be careful. We don't, you know, we don't want to get this guy over 160 innings or whatever. So when you're just sort of calibrated to be that way, um, and then, you know, you sort of venture to a place where you haven't been, you know, really high pitch counts, a big load of innings. You know, they turn too many of them turn into Steven Strasburg. That's all I'm saying. So it's debatable whether it's just kind of the uh, softening of major league pitchers because this is how they're used to doing it now. I don't know, but I think that's another reason why a six man rotation to me sounds pretty damn good. And I I know I've talked to John Mosaic about it. There have been a few times the Cardinals have thought hard about it, only to be slapped down by the manager, uh, Matheny especially. And uh, I don't think Schilt was crazy about it. I don't know about Ali. But listen, John Mazalek, and uh, he he does respect his managers, but and, and he does listen to them. And if they're adamant about something, he'll let them – He'll let them stand with what they want to do as long as it's not something totally bananas. But, you know, if if John Mosaic really wanted the Cardinals to go to a six-man rotation, I think he would. I think he'd put it in. He's the one, in my opinion, is the reason why, the number one reason why the the Cardinals all of a sudden is, oh, no, Tyler O'Neill's got to be in center field. That's not Marmol. That's Mosaic. I'm confident of that. But anyway... Getting back to this, and maybe there'd be skepticism, you know, people saying, well, they don't even have five good starters. You know, well, now you're going to put a sixth in there? Yeah. His name's Matthew Libertor, actually. Yeah, I think I'd do that. Uh, and maybe some of these fellas could um, could use an extra day, and they'll stay healthy, they'll stay fresh, they'll be stronger when they pitch. Little things like that. Now, do you think Ali Marmol is going to do that? In the season, which is the Adam Wainwright Hero Tour, the Farewell Hero Tour, <laughs> I'm just laughing at the very idea that that's a possibility. <laughs> no, I got to go. Oh, no, I can't. We can't switch to a six six man row. We, we got we we got to give Wainwright the ball every fifth day. I mean, he owes he, he deserves that. Okay, so. The, the Cardinals always, uh, even though they have been consistently good for a long time, they're, they're still so weird about certain things. But anyway, I'll shut up about that. Um, the reason I, I mentioned an injury, because uh, the injury issues, because uh, Jim Hewer informed me during the break. Jeffrey Springs, who's a really good pitcher for the Tampa Bay Rays, who, by the way, will be going, um, going up to Toronto tonight to uh, – what it, yeah, seeking 14 straight wins. They open a series in Toronto with a 13-game with a winning streak that they want to uh, turn into 14, and that would set the modern record. Um, and so that's going to be a fun game no matter what. But the Diamondbacks did get experience some adversary because Jeffrey Springs, um, 30-year-old pitcher, this year in his first three starts had a, had an 0.56 ERA and the Rays by far have uh, the best uh, starting pitching ERA in the majors. So this is an elbow thing and apparently it's going to sideline him for a few months. I mean, I, it's an early estimate, who knows, but 
they've already got some pitchers beat up. I mean, Zach Eflin's on the IL. I, I think, of course, Ta- Taylor Glasnow's on the IL. And uh, don't know when he's coming back. Uh, I do know that um, on Twitter and over at Cards Talk, uh, there, there's a segment of fans that would give up, uh, you know, uh, just give up like this huge treasure to get a guy that, that that constantly breaks down as a pitcher. They want to bring him in. Oh, give him, you know, give oh, give him, oh, give, give him Carlson. Give him, you know, well, can we wait to see if he can actually pitch? Yeah, slow down, people. My goodness. Um, so that's going to increase the challenge, Jim. But as you said, to repeat what you said about Tampa Bay and how they'll handle this. They will go down to the minors and they'll just grab another guy and go, here, you throw three to four innings and we'll be fine. They just find arms. They're really good at it. And by the way, I found some info. It's an ulnar neuritis, which means it's close to that Tommy John talk. So he's going to be mm-hmm. out for quite some time. But I just read a story over the weekend about how you know they – Got him again. He was injured when they got him, and they said, "Well, we're going to teach him some things." And he talked about how what he learned there, and he's become super, you know, effective. And it's a shame that he's hurt this week, but that's what the Rays do. They'll just go find another guy. I, they're so good at it, and it's going to be a guy. I'll, I'll be honest. I'll go. I don't know who this is, but he'll give him <laughs> three to four innings, and you go, "Yep." They're just making a bullpen game out of this, and they're winning more games. Tonight they got uh, Dennis Rasmus going against Barrios in that game. So. You know, it, 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 a very brief detour because we're talking about injuries, and I'm switching sports, but there's a lot of things that bug me about the NBA, and yet I, I, I like it. But, I mean, it, there's many annoying things. Now, finally they negotiated a deal that a collective bargaining agreement that's going to eliminate a lot of this, uh, you know, um, load management BS. It, yes. Basically, load management means. Um, well, I hope you know. I hope some of you guys are honorable about this, but I know a lot of you will just say, "Well, I don't feel like playing." You know. Oh yeah. And, and that's so. They're they're finally trying to cut down on that. Um, but you know who the biggest joke is in the NBA? Well, there's a lot of them. I can't say he's the biggest. He's on the group of biggest jokes list. Is Zion Williamson in New Orleans? Uh, does this guy ever actually play ball? I mean, does it like does he actually play for uh, the New Orleans Pelicans? I know he's on the bench all the time. I know everyone, all these people on ESPN and everywhere else. It's like where they're into this like rock star worship of players who have a brand or whatever. Um, the dude, it's just ridiculous. And so I read, I came across a story um, last night reading. You know, he didn't play for the Pelicans in the play-in games, and he's been out since January. And before, the, I believe it was the game where they were eliminated. He's out there He's out there on the floor, like in the afternoon, and he's like sprinting down, and he's, throw, he's throwing down tomahawk jams, and he's doing all this stuff where you're like, wow, my goodness, he looks great. And, you know, and then he's throwing down more dunks and he's like putting on a show. And, and it's just like, so, hey, he's back to that, in that game, right? He's coming back. No, he didn't play. It, I don't know. I don't know how you can be an NBA coach and stay sane. I just don't know how you can do it. It is an amazing. Look, his talent is through the roof and he is fun to watch when he's healthy or when he's on the floor. Let's put it that way. I don't know if he's ever healthy. But I was reading, and this, like you said, he didn't play. I read a couple of weeks ago when this, we're getting down to crunch time, and I was like, "Oh, Zion! Oh!" And they're like, "Well, he's been out since January, like you said, with a hamstring." And I go, "Hold on a minute, a hamstring? <laughs> the, six weeks, he should be fine." That was in January. It's almost April. It was the beginning of April. I was like, "Come on, there's got to be something more to that." I, that's just if he can't play. After sitting out that long with a hamstring, he'll never play. You know, C.J. McCollum, uh, their, their shooting guard, he he kind of mouthed off a little bit, did not name drop uh, Williamson directly, but everyone knew the hell he was talking about. You know, McCollum was telling reporters, he said, look, man, you know, I didn't say anything about it, but I'm playing with a really bad finger, and it, it really does affect the way I shoot the ball and handle the ball and everything else. But it's like, man, you just got to gut it up and play. That's, you know, and that's what I've tried to do. Um, you got to play through some of the pain. And then he basically said, you know, w- you know, we need our guys to play. 
We need him to play. Absolutely. And that's exactly who – you know who he was talking about. Oh, yeah. About. It's amazing. I That whole time with him, the, the whole experiment has been awful. If you're able to go out there, and, you know, for 20 minutes and throw down dunk and, dunks and put on a show – you you can uh, you can give your team about 30, uh, 35 minutes I would think Absolutely. with their seasons on the line, but not him. It's one of the reasons it's just become a big turnoff to me. It really has. Um, if a guy's legitimately hurt and he takes a proper amount of time to get back, that's good. That's fine. But this is a joke. He hasn't played since January. Played uh, uh, he's played twenty nine games this year. You know. Yeah. I mean, come I, on. That's just terrible. And I would almost look at him. And go, go on out there and play. Well, I might. Yeah, and if you if it snaps again, so what? We'll be done for the year. You got all summer to wait. That's Just right. That's play, a really kid. good. It's a really good way to look at it, you know. And the the the, the Celtics all all but have to like order order Jason Tatum to take a night off. He just won't do it. And mm-hmm. of course, he does because it's smart to take a few. But uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I I just don't know. That culture is so strange, you know. All these teams thinking that they'll be the savior and can turn. Oh. Turn around, Kyrie Irving. You know, how'd that work out in Dallas? Yeah, I, the fact they didn't even make the playoffs is no pretty amazingly awful. So um, it's just it's just a strange culture in the in the league. Some of the greatest athletes in the world, and I enjoy watching, especially the playoffs. But uh, man, I don't know. All right, I'm, let's let's go back. And I got time. We got the commission coming up at uh, five o'clock, and uh, let me uh, pull up my file on this because the Jordan Hicks stuff is just. Uh, um, I don't know. What, what, well, it was what, just beyond frustrating. After yeah. just two pitches last night, you went, "Oh my gosh, it's he's he's not going to be able to get anybody out." No, and you go, oh, "He's out there for three guys, whether you like it or not." Good luck with this one. So th- last night, Marmol, for reasons that are known only to him, decided that Jordan Hicks was the solution from the bullpen to relieve Jordan Montgomery. So to reset it for you briefly, runners on first and second. Top of the seventh. Pirates are leading one nothing. In other words, it's a ball game. And, and, yeah, we now know that the Cardinals couldn't score, but we didn't know it at the time. Um, so they're leading one nothing. It's a really, it's a really, it's a really tough spot. It's a high leverage spot for, for Hicks. So what does he do? Uh, he walks the first batter. Base is loaded. Uh, then... Set, that sets up a sack fly. It's two to nothing Pirates. Then came another walk, which reloaded the bases. Marmol went out there to take him out because he finally could because he had to pitch to three batters. He brought in Cabrera, and I know Cabrera gave up a couple solo shots after that in the next inning, I believe. Yes. But he got a big strikeout to end the inning. And listen, I know the Cardinals' bullpen has been overworked. I know that Marmol had some, uh, you know, he didn't have a lot of great choices, but that's also baseball. You know, you do what you can. What you don't do, what you don't do is put Jordan Hicks into a one nothing high leverage game with two, two runners. on. You don't do that. And every single number screams that. So if the manager who I think is in a lot of the really smart numbers, I don't know, he's had a relapse or something. Let me read these things to you. And listen, man, the only way I can tell you how bad this was is by to tell you the numbers instead of just saying, he sucks. You know, I, I, I like to back it up just to show you how preposterous it is. All right, this season, first batters that have faced Hicks when he walks in, right? Mm-hmm. Three for four, uh, 750 batting average, two walks, a homer, no strikeouts. In high leverage situations, opponents are three for five with four walks and no strikeouts. Despite throwing all those 100 mile an hour pitches, you get the broadcasters really excited. He's got a 16% strikeout rate. 16%. Oh, man, did you see that? That thing was 103 miles an hour. Holy, holy cow. Nobody ever gets that. He get a 16% strikeout rate, and he's walked 26% of the batters he's faced. This season, when Hicks has his uh, when he's entered a game, he's retired the first hitter only one time. And when the first batter reaches base against Hicks, the opposing team in those situations have gone on to score a total of six runs. One time this year, he's retired the first guy to face him. He hasn't had a 1-2-3 inning. 
He has thrown 20-plus pitches in an inning four times. He's had one shutout inning, and only 34% of his pitches are strikes. And his his that huge walk out that huge walk rate's the worst in the land. You already knew that. So I I don't know what they think they're seeing, except they're being as dumb as the people that get aroused by uh, the hundred mile an hour stuff. I don't know, even though it doesn't really do anything for him because he don't know how to pitch, and he can't even get his mind ready to pitch, as he has said. And as Ali Marmal has acknowledged, oh, yeah, we'll talk to him. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, have yourself a nice chat. And then bring him back in in a high leverage situation. How, how's that going to work out? Anyway, he's, only, he's pitched five and a third innings. He's allowed eight hits, eight walks, six earned runs, 10-13 ERA. 16 of the batters he's faced have reached base. Uh, opponents are hitting 361 against him. See, they're slugging 636 just it goes on and on and on and on bottom line is since uh, the beginning of 2021 season he's got a 5280 ERA terrible strikeout rate terrible walk rate and just this terrible um track record of just virtually failing every time he faces the first batter when he meaning Hicks comes in from the bullpen and they keep running them out there. I, this goes on the list, and I don't actually have a list, Jim. <laughs> We're going to have to start but, making it, though. But but of all the things I've seen at Cardinals baseball for a long time, you know, mm-hmm. this goes on the list of the most stupefying things that in situations I've ever seen. You know he's going to fail. And you know he's going to, like, ruin a game for, say, Jordan Montgomery. And yet... You bring him in as if none of this has ever happened, as, as if he is like, um, you know, peak form Bruce Souter or something, you know? It, it's just ridiculous. He's worked himself into the role that Stratton had last night at the end of the game. He's the guy you bring at the end of the game when there's nothing to play for. Not like to your point, not at that high leverage situation. That's texter right. texter uh, points out, hey, it would have been a nice spot for Drew Verhagen last night. I think they wanted to leave him alone. I, didn't he p- pitch twice in the course field thing? And, again, don't get mad at me. I just know yeah. you, we all know that. He pitched the day before. I know that. I think, you know, they, they don't want to, like, uh, push him too much. And, again, don't kill the messenger on that. I'm just telling you what they were feeling. I, I think they, they had a, a couple guys on that. Uh, do not uh, do not use list, but no, uh, no, absolutely, you would prefer Ray Higgins in that spot, no doubt, no, no doubt, just about anybody in that spot over Hicks. I look, and Stratton wasn't good last night for the first time in a while. He'd been good. I would say at this point, based on performance, Stratton moves ahead of Hicks at any high leverage spot. In this, he better, you know, I, that was not the case in the way they were used last night. Like, you on. know, and and let's cut. Um, Let's cut Chris Stratton a break here. You know, he's appeared in uh, five games. He's got a 284 ERA. That that was only the second time he's allowed a run. It was a lost cause anyway. So I don't want to beat – not that you're doing it, but I don't want to no. beat up on him too much. I mean, you know, if you look at Stratton as, as far as his stuff – and let me look at this real quick. it only take a minute. I apologize. If you look at what he's done this year – um, his walk rate's really low. He doesn't put people on base. His strikeout rate's about 22%. That's not great, but it's, you know, it's fine. Um, there, He's given up a 182 batting average. Even with the home run last night, the opponents are only slugging 273 against Stratton. Stratton's been really good. But again, on Cards Talk and some other plays, oh, they, when are they going to designate him for assignment? What? <laughs> What? what? <laughs> he's been a, he's been really good pitching for the Cardinals, but you know I don't know why I get worked up about this because we know how it is in the culture. The last thing you see is how you choose to define an athlete. You know, yeah. If he if he pitches well, if a starting pitcher pitches really really well, you know, I could see him being in Cy Young contention. You know, but if Chris Stratton, who's done a hell of a job for the Cardinals, actually. He gives up a solo home run and a lost cause. It's like, uh, they got to dump this guy. You know, 
So you only re- that's that's about ninety percent of America only only remembers like the very last thing they saw. It's the way it works nowadays. What are you going to do, right? Yeah. What can you do? 